Hello everyone and uh, welcome to a really special session we have today. We've got uh, Nick Rogers, who's the engineering director of uh, Jaguar Land Rover and uh, Jerry McGovern, who's the chief creative officer of Land Rover. Both of them in this wonderful setting in their Gaden Triangle, their new facility, which kind of brings engineering, design and purchase under one roof. Fantastic backdrop as well. You can see the uh, legacy of the brand from the Series 1 Land Rover all the way to the new uh, Range Rover autobiography. Gentlemen, thanks very much for uh, uh, speaking to us at Autocar India. Great to have you together in one frame. And uh, really that uh, brings me straight away to, uh, you know, the whole idea of having uh, this, uh, uh, having both the disciplines under one roof, which is uh, engineering and design. I'm sure there are instances when you all both need to work really closely together. I'm sure there are a lot of areas of conflict and this is where it kind of gets yeah. sorted out. So how's it been uh, in, in this new facility? I know it's uh, just recently been kind of inaugurated and then we've had the lockdown. So perhaps we've not seen the full, uh, you've not taken full advantage of it. But has it completely changed the way of product development? Nick, uh, I'd like to start with you. <laughs> so, um, welcome to uh, Jaguar Land Rover. Um, as you just said, this is our new um, engineering center and design center. We're now together. Um, it really is absolutely incredible that we've got such a state-of-the-art facility that is such a joy to come and work in. And our engineers and designers love coming together. They've got collabor collaboration spaces, as well as having space where they can actually work separately without um, context switching and really, really focus on what they need to have. It is a tremendous facility. Um, unfortunately, we're still in the midst of uh, lockdown. Um, we have between us about a thousand people working on this site, but it's normally 10,000. Um, so some of the critical activities are still taking place and critical testing activities, but the main people are working in isolation. But we're starting to get people to come back. We're starting to get that real desire to come back in and just use this incredible facility that we've got and we're incredibly honored to uh, to have it so it's a great facility it's great that we work together and good that you notice the uh, legacy behind us the uh, 1948 series one and the latest uh, 1970 um limited edition autobiography car because it's 50 years of range rover so uh, and this was absolutely a blue. A great legacy. Jerry, Jerry, how's it been for you? Uh, you know, uh, obviously, again, uh, uh, you're now coming to the facility off and on. I understand that there's just so much you can do work from home. And mm -hmm. when you have a facility like this, it must be frustrating not being able to really use it to the max. So uh, uh, how's uh, uh, moving forward? I mean, uh, are you finding this has kind of really changed the way, uh, uh, you know, things happen much faster, more efficiently? Just give us a sense of uh, how you see this really, uh, uh, you know, in, in terms of more creativity and, and better design. Mm. Well, remember, we were using this facility very well before the, the lockdown took place. And the important thing is that designing a vehicle is a, a collaborative enterprise and you need designers to create and you need engineers to engineer. I need Nick to engineer the vehicles that me and my team uh, create. So that relationship is, is key to everything. And um, having a facility like that encourages it. What's happened since um, lockdown? Well, interestingly for us, it, it hasn't been too much of an issue because in our product cycle, we are finalizing or some of the, the next generation of products are in the maturation phase which means you don't need to be building and making models and you've already done them to a degree. And then the, the conceptual stage that we're in with the new generation of products means that we don't have to build too many models either because we can do that you know, sketch phase two-dimensionally, three-dimensionally, whatever, without being in here. So, in here. so during this period, it hasn't been uh, too bad for us, clearly. If, it, if, if the lockdown goes on too long, it will become an issue, but we're already starting to come back. And, uh, you know, how do you all work together uh, as individuals, as teams? I mean, uh, you know, now everyone's under the same roof. Earlier, I'm sure, however much you all work together, 
You all must have been in silos. I mean, uh, today, can you just walk across, uh, have joint meetings, uh, you know, that sort of thing? Uh, is it, you know, more of the kind of uh, human interaction? Obviously, with, uh, with the lockdown, that's been difficult. But I mean, the whole idea of being able to be more collaborative, I'm sure that's really been uh, the entire objective. I think the uh, having a great facility like this is one thing, but it won't change culture. Culture has to come from within the people. And, um, you know, I remember I've been in the business a long time. Clearly, I don't look it, but I, but I have. Uh, that was supposed to be a joke. <laughs> um, and I can remember through my career the design an engineering relationship in various companies has been quite fraught, to say the least. You know, fighting, you know, the designers throw the design over the wall to the engineers and the engineers throw it back and say, you can't do it and never the two shall meet. The world has changed massively and it's incumbent on, on us designers and engineers particularly to work much closer together for the greater good, ultimately for the benefit of the customer through creating truly desirable products. And I'm not just saying it because Nick's sitting there, but Nick has a desire to actually deliver our designs. He's hell bent on delivering the designs that we create. And at the same time, I want the designs that we create to be well engineered. So, you know, it's mutually Compatible, and I, you know, I look around the world and I see other manufacturers, and I see the re results of their endeavours. Without, you know, without criticising, you can see in, in in some vehicles that that balance between design and engineering isn't there. I think with our vehicles, um, it clearly is. Yes, uh, is uh, you know interesting. You bring about uh, you know the, the fact that you'll have to work together, but. Just behind the scenes, Nick, I want to toss this to you and ask you very frankly. I'm sure Jerry must be coming out with certain things which he wants. Do you sometimes just toss it back and say this is not feasible? I mean, it could be a certain, uh, uh, you know, a process in stamping, which is a lot more expensive to get a certain crease line or a character line. Uh, how do you all kind of work this back and forth? Because I'm sure Jerry must be wanting to push the envelope in design as much as possible. And, uh, you know, a lot of it maybe is not feasible largely because of cost. Uh, I'm sure on the regulation side, uh, that's, um, that in itself, I'm sure, would be a limitation separately. But how does this back and forth go or are you in sync right from uh, the drawing board stage? Well, I think you can see from um, the new Evoke we've just launched or the new Defender that we work very, very closely together. One of the things that I always say is that when you drive a car, you can feel the engineers, you can feel the designers, you can feel that spirit, and you can see it in the product, that those two things have come together very, very tightly. And I think Jerry would agree on the new Defender, I'm not sure who was encouraging who the most. We were absolutely obsessed about making something incredibly authentic, and that incredible look of the car was absolutely paramount to that. And we believe when you actually drive the car, you can then feel that coming through, you can see it in the fit and finish, if you look at the new Evoke, together we challenge each other to almost halve the gaps mm. on the new Evoke. And that has just come from design being adamant, we must push less, and us doing exactly the same. Uh, uh, and the uh, way we come together is, we, we have uh, good fun as well, yeah. don't we, Jerry? I think, you know, our design strategy is, is well known and it's well considered. You know, I don't come from the school of what I would call flower arranging, you know, a crease line here, a cleat, a crease line there. There's a high degree of creative <laughs> intellect that goes into it. And as you probably know, I'm a great advocate of modernism in all, in all, you know, in the, in the built world and in all types of products. And I think, you know, part of the consideration is that of that is knowing how much you should push engineering and what is, what is doable and what isn't. And clearly, engineers love to do what they've done before because they know how to do it. And, you know, like a lot of us, we don't like to be taken out of our comfort zone. So part, it is partly my job to push Nick and his team to a degree. But at the same time, I need to know when to stop, you know, when it is doable, when it's, 
you know, when it is uh, within costs and legislation and all those other things. But I think that's all built on having a relationship of trust. And, you know, I trust him. I hope he trusts me. Of course and, I do, Jerry. And, uh, you know, there's this mutual respect for each other that I think is so important. And, I, you know, I'm not saying it again because he's there. I've worked with lots of engineers in the past. And, you know, I get on with better with him than I have any in the past. It's as simple as that. Because he does what I want him to do. <laughs> I, I'd, I'd also say um, we're really lucky um, that we've got fantastic brands. And there's definitely a spirit in the whole organization, in design, in the manufacturing engineers, as well as, well as the um, core engineers, where doing things that shouldn't be possible actually is motivational. And we actually like the challenge of if we're in the studio and someone says you can't do that, that actually is more of a yeah. throw the gauntlet down, let's go and find a way. You know, the, the, the challenge to say go and almost halve the gaps on the evoke when you did a new one, we just wrote it on the wall and said let's go and find a way to do it. And it works. So that, that spirit of spurring each other on and oh, tension. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and if it can't be done, you know, bring it on. But I'd also say with, with design is that, you know, I, I am, I am just an engineer. I'm not a, not a designer, but I do love good design. And we spend time looking at furniture and mm. architecture and things together. And, and, and no, I, you I, know, I let's like correct that. I advise you on that. <laughs> I mean, I'm never, I, I'm, the, I'm never going to tell him how to engineer a suspension system. And he's never ever going to tell me how to shape a car. And that's all about respect for each other's disciplines. And, that's something throughout the business that we hold dear that, you know, the experts in the various disciplines that have to come together, you have to respect them. So I generally don't invite people in and say, what do you think? I might ask them, but I'm not necessarily go going to, to listen to them. I think the other important thing is, is that, and we have to thank Mr. Tata for this, you know, when, when Tata bought JLR at that point, Nick was in a different position at that point but design used to report into engineering now as much as i love you know nick and engineers in general you're never ever going to get the right balance if one is above the other in term organizationally and i think because it's what that communicates to the designers and engineers that at work within those communities within those organizations. If one is above the other, there's always that in the back of the mind. So I think that is absolutely crucially important. And we very rarely get to a position where it, we can't reconcile a conflict between design and engineering. We generally can't find a way one. through it. I genuinely can't I mean, think of one. Ultimately, the CEO has to be the arbiter if that happens, but I can't remember the last time we had to, to do no. that. No. But that, that's an interesting point. Uh, you know, I, I just want, if you can elaborate a bit more, you talked about resolving conflict between design and engineering. Is it possible to give some examples where these, in the areas of the car where these conflicts might arise? It, could it be wheel size where the designers want <laughs> as large wheels as possible, but there are engineering restraints over there? Could it be the choice of materials in the cabin where, again, the designer would want, you know, the best materials, but obviously there's a cost impact over there. I know there's no, uh, uh, you know, there, there's no negotiation on the safety and regulation side, but just, uh, you know, between the engineering cost, we don't have purchase over here. I'm sure they obviously influence things a lot. But if you could just share some examples of where there is conflict and where, how you how you all resolve it, because that would give a better perspective. So genuinely, um, I would say there's areas where we challenge each other. But generally, there isn't conflict. You know, do I, I mean, want do, do I want to see recycled materials? Do I want to see modern materials? Do I want to see exotic materials? Absolutely. Do I want to see superb fit and finish? Absolutely. Do I want to see crispness of surface? Absolutely. So I think all of those things. And yes, there is some challenge with legislation. But as you see with the new Defender, we pride ourselves on not only the car being safe for the occupants inside the car, and I promise you, it is the stiffest and strongest safety cell ever. But the details on the outside of the car are good for the environment as well. And we've absolutely thought about pedestrian impact and all those other things that are really important. Yet we will build absolutely the safest car. So 
I think we can do both. And I think this recipe of challenge works. The, the, yeah, the, the biggest conflict invariably, I think, and you probably see it more in other companies than, than ours, is a prerequisite of good design is optimum volume and proportions. What that means Oh, yeah, is, absolutely. Je you know, Jerry, yeah. I have to hand it to yeah. your proportions are phenomenal. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, wheel-to-body relationship, front overhang versus rear overhang, you know, depth of glass to body, position of A-pillar relative to the wheel, and all those things. And people think you just it doesn't matter, but I could show you an illustration of the current Range Rover in fact, I'll send you them, the current Range Rover, and then I'll show you what happens to that car if you just change the positions of some of those things. The design is still, kills the it. surfacing is the same, but it kills it. So that's always the fir first thing, and that's where we will push. And, and Nick and his team are always trying to give us what we want because we are the experts of being able to visually look at something and tell you what looks balanced and what, and what doesn't. But the other thing is you mentioned cost. Now, good design does cost money. And if you're setting yourself up as a business and you say to yourself, or the business agrees you want to have design leadership, there is a cost against that. If you set yourself up as a business that wants designs that are mainstream and that are at best, you know, um, they don't have design leadership, but they're not bad, but they're, they're mainstream, You'll, the cost of that isn't as great. So there are times clearly when we have to get cost out. The general view is you don't take the cost out where the customer can see it. Because let's face it, when people buy our vehicles, when they buy Range Rovers, when they buy Defenders, these are vehicles that they have an emotional connection with. They're not commodities. You know, they're products that actually you could argue they don't need, but they desire. And there, once they've got them, they have to fulfill that desirability in the, in the way it's been put together, in the engineering, in the design, the materials, the material finishes, the precision, all those things. Uh, Jerry, you, you raised a very good point. And I think one thing that's really struck us about your design is, you know, the sense of proportion. Just mm -hmm. absolutely brilliant and spot on. And is it fair to assume that with that, everything becomes a lot more easier. I mean, just looking at the shapes you have, they are, you know, they're not, uh, they are, uh, how would I say that they're, they're traditional, they are upright, but it's well, they're more, they're, they're they're absolutely modern. fantastic, you know, in, in the sense, I mean, it's, uh, you just got that traditional kind of proportion, but uh, they look very modern. So, how much time do you spend on getting those proportions absolutely spot on before you kind of move on? Is that really the most critical part in uh, designing uh, a car? Yeah, and that's where the most interaction between the designers and the engineers take place because Nick and his team need to engineer the architecture to give us that platform. So suddenly, sorry, that proportion. So suddenly through Nick's engineering, if certain things have to, have to grow, rear over, anchor into over, anchor impact legislation, they have to be incredibly innovative about dealing with the legislation in a way that meets the rules but can still give us the things that we need to have that optimum proportion. I mean, pr pr perhaps an example would be if you look at the new Defender, you're obsessed about the stance of the car. And so right at the beginning, two key things that we did we said the spare wheel must go on the back so the rear overhang can be absolutely cut back and completely square. That's what we wanted to do. And we said it must have really large size wheels so it looks like it can go anywhere because it can go anywhere. And so we put 815 millimeter diameter wheels. Now I promise you in other OEMs and you know in our previous lives we've, we've seen that, that would never happen. And, and you had the engineers itching to do it. So as the engineers were really, really keen, let's go and get 815s, let's find a way of making it happen, and then design the car around it. Or if you look at the new, new Evoque, that has got larger wheels on it than any other car in its segment. But the proportions are right, and that's what creates the I mean, desire. And, it, and it's, it's good fun to make something with big wheels, all the poise, all the handling, all the dynamics, of something that would be easier. And so it's that spirit of, let's find a way to do the unthinkable. Mm -hmm. We just love. I mean, big wheels, you know, as a designer, you know, from a very early age, 
I drew big wheels. I can big remember, circles. I can remember engineers <laughs> saying to me, you'll never, ever get a 20-inch wheel on a car. You know, next generation Rover, Range Rover will probably have a 23-inch. That aside, wheels are crucially important by pure virtue of the fact they're the balancing act. You know, a proportion is volume, and our bit, some of our vehicles are large because they carry a lot of people. They can do anything. They can go anywhere. But having a big wheel shrinks the visual mass of the vehicle. You know, so that's really important, um, as are a, a, lot of, a lot of other things. But interestingly, with the Defender, in a way, its proportions are a natural consequence of what it's capable of doing. You've got to have minimal overhangs to actually go off-road or on all terrains, approach, departure angles, break over angles. And as Nick said, the putting the spare wheel on the back to protect that all-important rear overhang actually made the design more characterful. You know, that sort of sheer, sheer severity of that cut off of the back against the sort of upright nature of the front. You know, when you look at Defender, there's nothing else like it. You know, nothing. You're Absolutely. Somebody. I mean, I drove, I drove the Defender in Namibia and I was just, just blown away with what it was capable of. It looks yeah. just absolutely fantastic. Just It looks the part. It's just, just amazing. I mean, for, but, for, me, for me, it would be a nonsense if, you know, when we launched the vehicle, you know, the reaction to it was incredibly positive. I think it was 99% positive sentiment. People loved it. Even, even the traditionalists. But then when it was tested, when we had the test drive, when Nick's engineering was tested, if it had come out of that, that, well, it doesn't handle very well, it's not capable, for me, that would have been an absolute failure for the whole car. But what the engineering reaffirmed what that design was about. We created the desire, but it was desire with absolute engineering integrity. So you mentioned um, technology and the changes in technology at the minute. So... Jerry and myself are so lucky that the world at the moment is changing so much. We firmly believe that post-COVID, the world is going to be different. We believe people are going to care more about personal transport. They're going to care about health. They're going to care about safety. They're going to care about, uh, care about well-being. And that tranquil sanctuary is going to become very, very important. So there's a lot of work that we're doing of what does the next generation of vehicles look like. And that is really exciting because we want to create something that's really, really cool with the right proportions, not just a simple pod, but we want to improve that space inside the car, that cabin, that tranquil sanctuary. And what does traveling in your in your bubble or your own well, it space... Well, it won't be a bubble. Not a bubble, literally, <laughs> but, but people want that personal mobility in their bubble, okay. their, their links. We talk about this in the UK as staying in your bubble of your near family, because obviously the tragic risk of COVID is, is, is terrible. So... That is such a cool opportunity, but also then looking at BEVs. How can a BEV look differently? How could a hydrogen proportion vehicle look differently? So those are all the really cool things that we're exploring together yeah. at the minute. I mean, right. interesting, interestingly, pre-COVID, in our interiors, and interior design has become more and more important over the years. I remember when I first started out, you, I just wanted to be an exterior designer. You know, interior design is the second best, you know, but that's all changed. Um, but this thing, Nick mentions this sanctuary. We, I mean, that was something for us that we were well into anyway, this thing called calm sanctuary, this notion of being in the car and having that sense of well-being that comes about from a design that's not overcomplicated, a design that's more intuitive, a design that actually l does things for you. Yeah, for me, I hate getting into a car and I feel like I'm in the cockpit of a 747. You know, it, it's, you know I'm, I'm not very clever because I'm a designer. So, you know, I don't want to be intellectually taxed. But so this, this notion of reduction is something that we've been well into. And I think what Nick's talking about is interesting because post-COVID, I think people will see their vehicle not only as this sanctuary from a calmness and well-being point of view, but they'll see it also as protection, the protection against the environment they're in. And I think that's an interesting sort of um, but, thing that will, will evolve. I just 
Sorry, I just want to come back to one interesting point you made on uh, the wheels, Jerry. It's quite interesting you say that they're getting bigger and bigger and the next Range Rover might have 23-inch wheels. But uh, Nick, coming to you, what are the engineering limitations on wheels? Is it the uh, wheel envelope? Is it packaging? Is it weight? Is it unsprung mass? All of the above. I mean, what is it that really kind of is uh, the limiting factor? Well, it's it, it, it's all of the above, as, 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 as you said. But if you go about the design of the car in the right way, larger wheels are fantastic for all terrain. Obviously, the larger the wheel, ultimately, the smoother it is when you go over the terrain, the larger the contact patch. Now, that's good, because both a Jaguar and a Land Rover, we care a lot about that. And so, if you start off right at the beginning, embrace it. So this is going to be the size of the wheel envelopes. This is going to be the size of the suspension system and really, really focus on it. And the active roll control systems that we're now developing, we can deliver the flying carpet, yet the poise and agility of something that really, really does feel quite small. And I hope you'd agree the new Defender, when you drive it, its agility is fantastic. And that feeling of being connected, no matter which way you turn it, it just goes in exactly the direction you want. And it's that connected feel, which is so important when you drive the car. But then it's the calmness and the tranquil sanctuary, as Jerry said, when you're in the car as well with your family or, or, or friends. The, um, I mean, a bit, and by the way, you know, I said wheels are getting bigger. There is a breaking point. There is a point where they don't need to get any bigger. Because, That's a relief. Because you'll actually get something disproportionate. You know, I would probably say... 23 inch is probably the limit unless the car gets bigger and we've got no desire to do that because they get heavier and costlier sorry they get heavier costlier uh, well, they get, and also there's the, the issue of sustainability clearly our vehicles some of our vehicles are bigger but they're well engineered and they're much they're much lighter than some of their competitors and they do things of course that other vehicles can't and as a consequence they do carry more weight. Um, but there is a point where we don't want to get make our vehicles any bigger. And in fact, in some instances, we are using what we call or what I call visual trickery to make things look smaller than they actually are. Right. And uh, I just want to turn to uh, another issue or another topic, which, uh, you know, for companies like yours, well, uh, sale now maybe around 500,000 units uh, a year with the whole group uh, is one of scale and hence cost. Uh, is this a challenge? Because clearly, you know, you don't have the scale of some of your rivals, which are four times uh, in, in, in number. And, and how do you achieve this? And how is this a big challenge? Because, you know, you have to invest in newer technologies, uh, new um, electric and electronic architectures, e &E architectures. You've got to have the latest gizmos. All the, you know, you can't afford to compromise on absolutely top-notch material and that comes at a cost which uh, you can't spread uh, too much, uh, you know, because of, of the scale. So, uh, is this a challenge and uh, is this again, uh, you really need to work very closely together to finally optimize the design so it's hugely, hugely cost-efficient in everything you do? So, you're absolutely right. Um, we haven't got the huge scale that the others have got. But we honestly see that as a positive. And I think in life, you have to look at what you've got and say, I am where I am. How do I turn that into a positive? Because we've got agility. You know, the fact that we got the I-Pace out first, the fact that we recreated the new Defender, and we're really excited of how, you know, we hope that's going to become the new icon. And all of the foundations and the feedback feels absolutely fantastic. But we take the challenge and the opportunity of being agile as a real opportunity for us. And of course, we're cost conscious. But in a lot of ways, that actually helps. We operate more as a family. So do Jerry and myself look at efficient ways of working? Absolutely. Do we look at using virtual techniques a lot? Yes, but we still use the physical techniques where we absolutely need to because you have to visualize things properly. But also, we're really lucky that we're part of a wider family. We're part of the Tata family. And so the support that we get from our teams in India is huge. And with the mechatronics and software revolution that's now taking place, that really, really fits to us accessing those teams who've worked incredibly well in isolation. We've actually seen a lot of the software space and the diagnostic space 
productivity actually increase for people at home? So we really feel we can operate as a global company. We really feel that we can pull those technologies from around the globe, really leverage the benefits of the globe. And we actually relish being the small agile one. And in this way, if I said, give us a challenge, we like to prove that it can be done if somebody says it can't. We see exactly the same with the products and the creation of the products. So we have a strong desire to be independent. We love being part of the bigger family that we are. And we love the mutual benefits that that family brings. And you know, in Bangalore particularly, where we've grown a fantastic team there, it's so cool to spend time with that team. The creativity, the passion to do things differently is simply awesome. So we're really excited. And we see this evolution world where BEVs, PHEVs, internal combustion engines have got a really important place too. And we're so lucky that Mr. Tata supported us with state-of-the-art gasoline and diesel engines. And as you know, we're just launching the next range of those this year. Also, with a range of PHEVs as well. But I promise you, we will push PEVs and hydrogen vehicles as well. So, we're excited. I think, I think the other thing is, you mentioned, you know, quite rightly, that we don't have the scale uh, of some of our competitors. That is exactly why we need to make sure that we are highly differentiated from them. Yeah. That is why we have to create compelling, emotionally engaging vehicles that truly resonate with people. Design. And, 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 you know, for me, design is a conduit that represents what a brand stands for. And, you know, actually thinking about it also is if you can create with these vehicles equity, I mean, Range Rover has got incredible equity. And for example, our Range Rovers, our Range Rover Sports, there isn't anybody out there that produces vehicles at that, at that price, at those price points that are selling anywhere near the same volumes as them. So I think it's important that we recognize how we are differentiated to the competition and make sure that we don't lose that. Because once, you know, things become comparable between one manufacturer, whether it's technology, the latest this, the latest that, what are you left with? You're left with the design and the equity within that brand. And that's why we have to absolutely nurture and curate that very carefully in, in the way we globally execute it. And the so, way what, it. Yeah. so what you're saying basically is to compensate for the lack of scale, it's got to be uh, slightly a bit more exclusivity because surely yes. if you don't have the numbers, yep. you're more exclusive yep. and get the profit from a bigger margin, which is driven by the brand and the differentiation. Yes. I, I think that's... Is, that's that, yeah. And, and this desire for innovation. You know, it's one of the coolest things about Jaguar Land Rover is the teams love to just find the way. And, and, and that is this special spirit that this building embodies. We're so lucky that this spirit of let's go and find the way. And, you know, and we've seen it through the challenges of COVID. We're not out the other side. But the spirit to find the way has just been amazing. Really it, good. Sorry. The, the other one is technology. You know, clearly technology is important and we hear everybody else talk about technology you know i i i did a sort of uh, presentation a few years ago in barcelona with various seniors from various companies and they talked about their companies they talked about technology but they talked about it in a way that it was a commodity in itself for me here we're more interested in what technology does for us particularly in design enabling technology, technology that enables us to deliver a design that makes that vehicle more appealing to the consumer. So give you an example of that, you know, the, the Range Rover Velar, you know, the technology that we put into those headlamps to give you these beautifully slim stealth-like headlamps, the technology that went into give it, giving us um, flush door handles, the technology that went into giving us that sort of less is more um, screen inside where it, it's reduced right down to its sort of, you know, secret to lit presentation. It, it's those sort of technologies that relate to something tangible than just technology 
for the sake of it. Yeah. And it's, it, it's, it's also, um, the way I would also describe it is, as engineers, we simply see it as our duty to make people's lives better. And, you know, that's yeah. one of the simple mantras that we have is that no matter what we've created, next time we want to find a way of doing it better, simply to make it better for the customer, better for the users. And we're a firm believer of all of the technology. We've done some great work at reducing the switches, um, having clear focus on one central point on the screen and, and, and other things. It was simply making life better, making it usable. And we now have got a tremendous team that works together on HMI. And that true drive for obsession for human science, for simplicity, ease of use, and low cognitive load. You know, one of the things that you can assess of a car, very hard to actually physically do, but the less taxing it takes to use it, the less mental horsepower it takes, the more you will enjoy it. And again, that's something how we just fit together to make there, things simple. And there has to be a balance to that too, because science is one thing, data is another, but if as a result you sort of um, undermine what you're trying to achieve from an aesthetic point of view, you have to make sure you strike the right balance. And incidentally, you know, as a, a designer, and I'm not just necessarily talking about car design, it can be great architecture, it can be product design, it can be any type of, you know, design for the built environment. Um, I truly believe that great design has the ability and it's incumbent on designers and engineers anyway, as Nick said, I truly believe it has the ability to enrich people's lives, but design has to be brilliantly engineered too, else it means nothing, depending on what the product is, of course. If you're creating a piece of art that's yeah. singular, you don't need it to be engineered, but something that is like the products we you know at the end of the day we're industrial designers we're commercial artists well, the artist is the wrong thing but you right. know for, for, i truly believe you know for me if somebody well, i get somebody that wrote to me the other day he's a guy who owns a a, a gallery in in london he's just bought a defender and um he dry he has a gallery in uh, uh, it's a sort of gallery that uh, sells creative arts objects, uh, uh, sort of paintings, sort of mid-century furniture, but a lot of Italian stuff. But he has a studio in in Holland, a gallery in Holland and one in London, and he's driving across to and fro all the time. Cool. And he's already taken his new Defender across the channel three or four times, and he absolutely loves it. And he's in love with it. Now, this is a guy that is highly design literate that has got heightened sensibilities of, of art and culture and to me for him to say those things about the car is you know that's to me it's know, awesome isn't it yeah it's uh, Je <laughs> yeah jerry you know on design uh, you know you've got a a great legacy as well uh, or which you're responsible for uh, how much of this is uh, actually a big advantage? Is it sometimes a challenge because to constantly, you know, draw from that legacy, keep the look, uh, you know, you've done a fantastic job, as I say, with the proportion and especially that, uh, you know, the, the low window line, which is just so characteristic of, you know, of your cars. How would you, uh, you know, uh, how would you sort of say that, uh, is it is it a challenge? Sometimes you want to just say, hey, I just love to just break all rules and do something completely different. Or do you feel that, you know, having this family look, this long legacy actually is a bit of a pole star for you and, uh, you know, a bit of a compass for you to follow? You know, I, I don't sort of see our work as being, you know, we, we have a view that whatever we design, it has to be re relevant for the world we live in today. Yes, we do have a unique heritage, but it's certainly not something we're harnessed by. And when I came back from America 20 years ago or, 15 years ago, whatever it was, I inherited this thing called a design Bible that was, that was, you know, about Land Rover when, when it just started. It was full of design cues, design philosophies that talked about sort of clamshell bonnets and equal glass to body relationships and all these things. And I went about that with a team and, and challenged it and said, well, what in, in the modern world, what is relevant from here? 
And, and what we've done is we've drawn from that in terms of inspiration, but we've presented those things in an absolutely ruthless, critically modern way. So for me, it's not about looking back. And, you know, it's a bit of a, it's a, bit of a, um, a disease in the automotive world that when it comes to design, you hear people say, well, is that stretched enough? What's the latest thing? For me, that's just styling. It's superficial. You know, I, to me, that doesn't interest me. I'm absolutely convinced that the journey we're on, the transformation we're on, we've transformed to a degree, but we continue to do so, is, is about bringing products that are right for the market, but most importantly, for the consumer, and it gives them the enjoyment, the fulfillment, and it also you know, re it reflects on them as people that they've got something that's truly special to them. I don't think there's anything wrong with that if you can do that in a sustainable, responsible way, and at the same time employ, employ you know, thousands and thousands of people doing it. Yeah, I mean, we're, right. we're in, in, incredible. Luckily, luckily, we create fantastic products that create jobs and wealth for everybody. It's superb. But to build on the challenge as well, I would say the Evoke definitely was taking strength from the past, but definitely pushing forward. And exactly the same with the Vela, or even the first Range Rover Sport when we did it. Yeah, you know, yeah. That was a, real, a yeah. real challenge, and it was, and still is, very radical. So we think that I mean, that, that ability to push out into yeah. the white space, we love it, don't we? Yeah, I, I mean, our approach is quite a sophisticated one. It's, yeah. you know, when people look at some, they say, oh, it's the same as the light. Look carefully, you know, look, Nick said, the, the current Range Rover Sport, look at the first one. They're, they're polarizing when you actually study and you compare the two, but they intrinsically capture the same essence. So when you look at the original Evoke and the latest generation, clearly when you look at the new one, it's an Evoke. It's got the falling roof, the rising belt line, that sort of cheeky, robust character. But when you look into, when you look closer, they're miles apart in terms of levels of precision, manufacturability, you know, luxurious materials, finishes. It's grown up, flush glazing, all the things that make it even more modern and appropriate for, for today, you know. And there isn't 150 slash lines all down the body side because it doesn't need it. And for as long as I'm around here, you won't see 150 slash lines on the body side. <laughs> Hopefully not, no, never, never. Yes, That's that Zorro never. design, Zorro. Yeah, yeah. This yeah, is absolutely. more. Mies van der Rohe, probably the greatest architect of, of the last century. And he was yeah. German, of course. Yeah, yeah. That was so, his slogan, uh, less is more. Yeah. Uh, Nick, I just want to turn to you on, a, uh, just turning back to what you had said, you know, when we talked about cost and the scale. You mentioned that you had out. Uh, you got a lot of stuff done in India, if I'm if I'm not mistaken. If I got you there, yeah, that's so true. Yeah. Can you elaborate a bit on that? Has uh, you know the Tata uh, kind of uh, uh, companies have they supported in any way? You know, with either uh, some of the Tata technologies or Tata Motors uh, things happening in Bangalore. If you could just elaborate a bit on that, because that would be interesting, because that really shows a synergy between the groups. Yeah. So. You know, we are extremely proud and excited that we're part of the Tata family and firmly believe that this mechatronics and software revolution that, that we're going through, being part of that family has given us the strength to excel in that space and to lead in that space. So this year, every single car that we launch will be always on, always connected, always up to date. So the no EVA 2 architecture will mean that every single car can be updated over the air every single car will have a diagnostics engine so we can actually monitor the health of the car continuously and send software updates out to do it. We wouldn't have done that without the support of TCS, Tata, Alexi and those other family partners with us. Yes, we have our own team in India as well, but they just completely work as one. And when you go into the offices, you don't know and it doesn't matter who is who and who they work for because they all just care about these incredible products. And the fact that we've now got connected services is going to be the USP we are going to lead. The fact that every single Jaguar Land Rover car we now make as we launch the new ones, all the 21 models is this year, none of them will ever go back to dealership for a software update. 
none of them will go back for diagnostics. We will do all of that through the back end, through the connected services. That is a real transformation. Customers can actually start talking directly with us, which again is a great thing. And we actually, in, in the lockdown, not sure if you, were, if you heard, we sent every single customer over half a million customers a transmission, a message about COVID, about be safe that appeared on their screens. And the publicity that got of the wow, look at that. And when you have a five-year-old defender, for example, in five years' time, you will be able to get the operating system of 2025 on that car. So we're really excited that those cars will be continually updated, which is fantastic as a customer. You get the latest functionality, the latest HMI, the latest capability. See, but you also means it's good for the environment because your old car can become new. So we're really excited. What so you're we're doing remotely right. making them relevant. Exactly. Constantly and you're relevant. helping residuals, you're helping them last longer, and, and you're going to get really cool tech. And we've seen with the Jaguar I-Pace, we've actually sent an update out which has given you 20 miles more range. And we're so excited that we've done that for the customers that already have a car. So there's customers that have owned an iPace for 18 months, and as a, as a gift, we transmitted this update to them. We think that's absolutely the future, and we're really so, excited that we're pushing yeah. that. So, Nick, that's interesting. You know, you've talked about how all the cars are going to be connected. Uh, the HMIs are going to be very sophisticated. So a question I want to ask is, do you think, you know, right now it's talking about platforms, uh, different generations of platforms. Do you think now we've come to a stage where the ENE architecture, the electrical architecture itself is going to be very critical in developing one that is future proof across the brands because that's quite expensive. So just your thoughts on that. I mean, is that sometimes I wouldn't say a limitation, but something that's absolutely crucial for the next generation of cars to be future proof because... There's multi-can, people are talking about flex ray, uh, you know, so uh, it's, uh, is this part of the car becoming in even more important than, let's say, the platform, which can kind of be modified and, and you know, upgraded? So, so I'd, I'd say there was a balance. So we've actually put an Ethernet backbone into our cars, which is state-of-the-art, to transmit data around the car at just lightning speed. That, that was absolutely the objective. And the electrical architecture is absolutely key. But you must never, ever forget the proportions of the car, the capability of the car, and the mechanical substance the desirability beneath it, and the, of the desirability. Car. She's and, all encompassing. And, it's, and getting that tranquil sanctuary, as well as services and technology that makes your life better, is because that's what our objective is, is how can every one of these operating system updates make your life better in the same way as you do with your, your phone? It should make your life better, it doesn't always, but our goal is to always make your life better each time, give you some enhancements, give you something to make life a little bit better, give you better range, give you better usability, or better deionization, or some of those things that just make it a better place to be. And so we see it as a balance. And, and what's really cool is we get to do both now. You know, HMI can be updated all the time, and the mechanicals takes a little bit longer, but that's, that's fantastic, isn't it? Right. And, uh, you know, uh, just lastly, it's uh, just going to, you know, coming to the end of our very fascinating session, but I just want to kind of end with talking about the future. Uh, Jerry, for you, a uh, really tough one to predict what customers are going to want, uh, uh, you know, let's say 10 years from now, we've got to start the process right now. We've got uh, millennials, which is really a bane for a lot of companies, uh, very short attention span, not very brand loyal. Uh, in, they want instant gratification, that sort of stuff. It's, it's, it's quite difficult. Which way do you see design, uh, you know, headed? Uh, are there any markers uh, or is it going to be traditional shapes which are just more and more evolved? Are we going to see something revolutionary? Clearly with electric EVs, uh, packaging constraints are no longer there, but it's likely that people will want a traditional form. And even then, turning to you, Nick, uh, you know, you've got a lot on your plate because, uh, you know, uh, uh, electric cars, whether we like it or not, and especially your government is uh, kind of put a, a date in the, uh, you know, cast a date in, in stone. So, and it's just two generations away. It's a bit crazy, quite honestly, but, uh, you know, that's how it is, whether it will happen or not. So intense uh, pressure that way to kind of predict the future and even predict the right path, because sometimes uh, 
uh, you know, you can't be on everything. It's just not, uh, you don't have the resources for it. So just mm. quick thoughts on the future. Very challenging, but very exciting as well, I'm sure. Jerry, from a design point of view. Um, the first you, very good question, by the way. I think you answered a lot of it yourself in the question. <laughs> but um, this thing about uh, what will customers want? Well, customers don't know what they want until they've got it. That's the first thing. And in fact, Henry Ford famously said, you know, if he asked his customers uh, what they wanted before he created the Model T Ford, they would have all said a faster horse. So I'm not so much worried about that part of it. There's been a lot of talk about um, electrification, and you mentioned it, the flexibility that gives you in terms of, in terms of the package, uh, which it does, but what it really does, it, it gives you a lot more space inside the vehicle. But in terms of the exterior form of the vehicle, the only advantage it really gives you is whether or not you want to pull the screen forward, if you want to go to a one-box or a semi-one-box shore bonnet, etc., which you can create interesting forms from. But I would question that against back to this thing about what is an optimized volume and proportion. And when we look at natural aesthetics form, you know, we look at people, certain shapes are the best shapes and they always will be. So, you know, I'm five foot nine. I'm never going to be six foot four. So I'll get over it. You know, I'll make the best of it. Um, so, uh, you know, the, uh, the I think what we have to do is we have to embrace the challenges that are coming at us. We have to accept technology. We have to accept legislation and all of those things. But we have to do it in a way that allows us to maintain the essence of what these products are about and what they mean to the consumers. Once we start thinking about these pr products as pure commodities, we're dead. We might as well go home. And, you know... You said it yourself. I mean, it's impossible to predict how things are going to pan out. But I'm absolutely convinced that if you create products that are truly desirable, that resonate with an, on an emotional level with the consumer, that where design plays a role in being the conduit for what that brand stands for, you stand a good chance of, of winning, or in this context, surviving. I 100% agree yeah, one of the thoughts I'd actually say is that uh, it's our job to solve problems that people didn't know they had. And I think that we, that we do that well together and we'll continue to do that. And as long as that is your main mantra, to create a product with desire, solve problems that people didn't know they had, make people's lives better, I'm certain the future will be bright. And the ways that we're tackling that, the way we're tackling connectivity, the way we're tackling keeping our cars up to date over the air, making people's lives better, this tranquil sanctuary, pulling together this products with real desire. I'm really confident about the future. And I actually think we're really just getting going. Yeah. And I think we've got so much. Well, no, I can do. keep going. Yeah, That's it, a it, question. Going. <laughs> he's, he's only a young lad. We've only worked together 30 years. So Yeah, he's a lot older than me. <laughs> <laughs> I've only been here 36 years. So I'm, I'm only a young boy. So, you know, we have got real opportunity, and I do think we're just getting going. I really, really do. I mean, the Defender has been so important to the two of us. You know, we've put our life and soul into that, but that's just the start. Because honestly, the fact that we've proved well, everybody don't undermine that what we can we've do been that. before, because yeah, we've some we great do, cars. We can do some really, really cool stuff. And, you know, the fact the world's changing, bring it on. Yeah. The fact the government want to have zero emissions vehicles, of course we agree with that. Of course we want recycled materials. Of course we want things that are environmentally friendly. Yeah. Of course we want zero emissions vehicles. Just bring it on. Bring it on as fast as you can. We want to do it. And COVID gives us the reason and the desire to bring something good from the terrible world that we've been in. So we're up for it. We're on fire. We're an awesome not team. Li not literally. And we've got, and we got, a, we got a brilliant place to be. Yeah. And an honour to have fantastic teams. The best with. is yet to come. Yeah, we've Watch just started. This space. Okay, great. And with that, we'll end it at that. The best is yet to come. And as Nick Rogers uh, says, uh, bring it on. Uh, Jerry McGovern, uh, really a delight and pleasure talking to you, both of you. Uh, thanks Make so much for the you. insights. Uh, clearly, we've got uh, yep. tough times ahead. I think everyone uh, will be facing a crisis uh, generations haven't faced uh, at all. 
but uh, I think uh, we are all going to come out of it and uh, wish you all the best and looking forward to um, exciting new products uh, from uh, Jaguar and Land Rover. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you. Look forward to seeing you soon. Thanks. Thank you. Thank Bye. You.